Welcome, everybody. I'm Greg Malcolm, the founder of Model Landmarks, and welcome to our Hacking Your Architectural Model webinar. Model Landmarks is a North American representative for Little Building Co., who makes those amazing architectural scale models. We stock all their products here in the United States, and uh, there are acrylic cases for them, as well as spare parts. So if anything goes wrong, uh, please reach out. Uh, we have spare parts for you. I want to thank all the modelers uh, who have sent us photos of their builds. We shared some there as you were waiting for us to get started. Love to get more. We'd love to feature those in our gallery on our website. So if you want to send us a photo, please pass it along. A little bit of housekeeping before we get started. This is a Zoom webinar, which means that the, for the audience, your microphone and uh, camera are turned off. The only people you'll be able to see are the presenters. And um, if you have a question, uh, you can put it in the Q&A at the bottom. Uh, all of the panelists can see your questions. I'm hoping we have time at the end. Uh, we've got a pretty full program. We may not get to your questions, but I hope we do. But put them in the Q&A, and we'll certainly, I will certainly uh, try to get back to you. Uh, we record all of our webinars. You can go to the Model Landmarks YouTube channel and find that. And what I do with the 30 minutes or so is I chop them up into smaller segments. So if you go on there, you can see the last couple of webinars. You can see segments. You don't have to watch the whole 30 minutes if you don't want to. And so if there's some part of today's program that you really want to see again, um, you'll find it. We should have that up there by the end of next week. So what do we mean by hacking your model? Can mean just about anything. Um, could be as simple as what Michael did here with his Jacob. So he owns a red Volkswagen Carmen Ghia sports car. So he found a small model of that and parked it in the carport of his Jacob's scale model. Uh, Scott took some of the labeling from the packaging that his model came in and added that to identify the model. Uh, Don, who's got a great collection of little building co-models, built a custom bookcase for it or a uh, shelving unit and also added the information cards that come with some of the models. That's, that's pretty cool. But you can also hack the model itself. So Chuck added some lighting to the interior of his Guggenheim. And then if you notice the roof of the model, he added the uh, gravel texture to make it look more realistic. Uh, Richard uh, painted and added lighting to his Queenslander. And Carl uh, built the Farnsworth house. He took the labeling from the box. Um, and but did not like the tree that came with the model. So he actually modeled his own tree uh, for his Farnsworth house. So today you're gonna to hear from three modelers who are gonna talk about actually three different scale models and what they did to it. But I do think what they're gonna talk about is universal. Um, no matter what sort of architectural model or almost really any model that you're gonna build, um, I think this applies to it. And I also want to mention that I'll be posting sometime next week a materials list. So the things that the modelers are going to be talking about today, uh, I will post a materials list. So if you wanted to uh, use some of the materials that they used, uh, that will be available. That'll be in the blog on our website. Okay, so let's get started. So our first speaker is Stephen. He's been a staff engineer at Underwriters Laboratory for over 27 years. And besides building architectural scale models, Stephen has over 45 years experience building space models. This is a photo of his uh, spare bedroom in his house. It is spectacular. Um, and um, his models are just amazing. You can see that detailed photo on the left there of the rocket that took the astronauts to the moon. That is an amazing scale model. Now he has also studied and researched front code right and his architecture since the 70s. He served as a docent at Wright's Roby House in Chicago for 15 years, and he's managed to visit over 50 Wright building sites. And I am super jealous. That is a photo of the interior of Unity Temple that uh, Stephen took. So today, Stephen is going to talk about how he took the Unity Temple model and created this amazing display. So Stephen? Well, thank you, Greg, for the kind introduction. And uh, if we could get started by going to the first slide, which is already there. I received the Unity Temple Kit as a Kickstarter contributor, and uh, I was immediately impressed with the quality of the kit. As this was a first generation kit, it came with a display box as part of the model. 
And the box was meant to protect and showcase the finished model when it's all done. Next slide, please. Uh, there was a few things I noted right away about the box. Uh, the plain wood interior really didn't match the nature of Unity Temple and its normal setting. Also, the model was allowed to roam freely inside the box when it was moved. And that could potentially damage the model if you ever had to ship it. So the first thing I did was to put a more appropriate background in by getting a captured image of some forest foliage, printed that onto self-adhesive paper, and trimmed it to fit the back and side panels of the box. And it provides a more appropriate setting for the temple. Next slide, please. Then I wanted to help protect the model without trapping it inside the box. So what I added was a couple of strips of gray styrene L channel to both sides of the box so that they just barely touched the top of the model's main platform. This kept the model in place and kept it from wandering around, uh, but you still had a chance to remove it if you ever want to take a look at it. Next slide, please. The opaque box didn't allow much light inside to showcase the model. So I added a homemade light box using a few pieces of sheet plastic, some plastic channels, and three strips of warm white LED strips. Those are connected to a 12 volt power supply outside the case. You can see the connector exiting the back there in the picture. Uh, this adds kind of an artificial sunlight to the model. Next slide, please. Here's, you can see the light box in use, uh, the three LED strips and the overall construction are pretty easy to see in this photograph. Uh, as Greg said, a bill of materials for the light box is available. Next slide, please. If I can, if you can see how much more lifelike uh, once this is all done that this model box now looks, uh, I thought it turned out so well, I built a second copy of the model and sent it to a friend of mine who turned me on to Frank Lloyd Wright as a Christmas gift. And it showed up in his house in Tennessee in perfect condition. So I guess the, uh, the model trapping system worked out just fine. Next slide, please. I became a real fan of these models, like Greg said, and I recently did the Johnson Wax building as well. Uh, I thought it turned out pretty well, but it lacked a certain identity, and I saw how other modelers did it. So I grabbed a copy of the old Johnson Wax logo off the web and printed it onto a decal, which I then put on the model's platform, uh, indicating the building's identity and its location. Last slide, Greg, please. You got to remember that Unity Temple model no longer comes with this wooden display box. It has a clear acrylic display case as an option. Now you can still do the natural background if you wanted to. But with a clear display case, getting natural lighting on the models, probably not a problem anymore. Uh, that's all I've got. Back to you, Greg. Thank you, Stephen. That, that, was, that was fantastic. And you did a great job with the, with the Unity Temple. So we're going to move on to our next presenter uh, is Paul. He's going to talk about how we hacked the Queenslander. Um, and Paul is currently in Yosemite. I'm very jealous. Uh, he's in the lodge there at Yosemite. So we may have some audio uh, choppiness. So just want to give you a heads up on that. Paul's a family man. He lives in Bellevue, Washington with his wife, Tina, and three daughters, Sophia, Natasha, and Cassandra. He's a retired marketing professional who now has a side hustle called Lifelong Learners that helps active seniors do more and have more fun. He's also on a journey to become a true craftsman. Uh, so besides building little building co-models, and that's the um, Sydney Opera House there on the left, in the middle is a model boat that he built. And on the far right is a full-size wooden kayak that he built, which is, is pretty amazing. So Paul, I'm going to turn it over to you. Uh, thank you, Greg. So uh, you're going to witness my hacking evolution. And I just I think of just really bring, beginning my career as a craftsman now that I'm retired. Uh, and I really like the idea of journeyman because I truly see it as a journey. And for me, it's a journey I've just begun. Uh, this is my third Queenslander. Um, the first one on the left, the second one on the right, and then the most recent one in the middle. Next slide, please. So uh, the models as they come, I call them nude, are just gorgeous. They're just perfect works of art as they are 
need no hacking whatsoever. Having said that, next slide. I think as in a gift of an appreciation, um, maybe Christmas, little building company sent me another Queenslander. So I thought this would make a nice gift. I had some spray paint lying around the shop and I used uh, the camouflage green for the sides, the eggplant color for the base, and then the flat black for the roof. And then actually in preparing for this presentation, it was very instructive in taking these pictures. And it's sometimes they're a little hard to look at as one who's aspiring for perfection. And what, what you can see is you can see how the spray paint or maybe not spraying the back of the, the roof, it distorted the wood a little bit. So on the one hand, of course, you wanna build a perfect model. On the second, if you wanna grow, I would highly recommend taking some close-ups, studying them and being your own critic. Next slide, please. Uh, <laughs> Unity, and th these are all materials I had lying around the shop, by the way. Uh, the Unity Temple, um, in, in, we're instructed to um, burnish some of the wood trim with furniture polish. I wanted more contrast and I had some liquid shoe polish lying around the shop. So I tried, uh, tried it on the trim and I, I was quite pleased with, with the effect. Next slide, please. So uh, as I built my third and final, well, not hopefully not final Queenslander, I actually love this model. Um, I had some, this time, some paste <laughs> sh uh, shoe polish lying around the shop. So I figured, okay, let's give that a try. And uh, lesson learned, if you're going to use shoe polish, don't <laughs> use stain if you want this effect. And, but if you still want to use shoe polish, don't use paste wax, use the liquid. The liquid went on far easier. So this, this turned out to be a real hack job. And I found that applying a little heat from a heat gun softened up the paste wax quite nicely, which made it much easier job to do. Uh, and then once again, you can see the close up picture revealed some of the distortions in the model, in the roof, and then at the, the platform, uh, which gives me food for thought to be self-critical and hopefully uh, take my skill level the next step. Next slide, please. Um, and then right now, um, I've um, in, in really enjoying getting this kind of stained effect. So I'm back to liquid shoe polish. Having said that, if I ever do this again, I will definitely use wood stain or I, I think Marcus uh, had some used some acrylic on his models with excellent result. Um, the other thing I'd just like to mention that Stephen mentioned is uh, I too have found myself building the same kit over and over. And the first one makes a great gift, which is the one that you make your mistakes. The second one is the one you keep. <laughs> Next slide, please. And then um, for me, I, uh, the building company matters more than just giving retired guys like me something to do with my free time is um, there's a housing boom going on in, in, our, in Washington state right now. And uh, you can see uh, the new architectural styles that are predominating. Uh, many people love these homes, live happily then. But I think what um, Little Building Company is doing is preserving an architectural heritage that it's critical for us to remember. And it allows us to remember it in a three-dimensional tangible form. So thank you. It's been a real privilege to be a part of this. Yeah, thank you, Paul. And, and I do want to mention to everyone that uh, a portion of this, all the sales uh, for Little Building Co. Uh, go towards the preservation of these models. So, for example, if you buy a Frank Lloyd Wright model, a portion of that goes to the Frank Lloyd Wright Foundation with the Farnsworth. It's the National Trust for Historic Preservation. So um, you are helping keep the, the real building going by, by uh, purchasing these models. All right. So for our next presenter, it's actually me. Um, I don't have a whole room dedicated to my models. I have a bookcase. Um, I really like doing architectural models. Uh, you can see I've got quite a collection of little building co-models and I also do a lot. I've got pretty much all of the uh, Lego architectural series and some uh, other uh, plastic block architectural models. So what I'm gonna talk about today is taking the Jacobs Usonian house. And I, I felt that that landscape on the outside really called for landscaping it. So, and that's what I did. Um, I did a very simple landscape, nothing particularly sophisticated. I think I'm sort of like Paul, I'm, I'm, I'm learning to be a better uh, modeler. 
Um, I did want to share a picture that Bob sent me of his uh, landscaping of the Jacobs model. And he did a much more realistic job than I did. Uh, did a beautiful job with the grass and the bushes. He also added some texture to the roof and a little guy waving. Uh, he just did a spectacular job. Mine is much more basic. So I'm gonna just talk about a couple of different elements. The first thing is this grass mat that I put on there. And I chose to just get a grass mat. You can get grass uh, filler that you can glue onto it, but I, I decided to go with grass mat, pick something that looks like a putting green. Um, the tricky thing though, if you follow my arrow, was this curve, cutting out the grass mat to match this curve uh, was a challenge. So um, this is a grass mat, it's, it's a piece of paper with a grass texture on the other side. And this is the curve that I was looking for. Now, if you haven't built the Jacobs, um, this is actually a piece of the model. So if you haven't built it yet, you can easily just take this piece, trace it onto the grass mat, and you're done. I had already built the model. So um, fortunately, I asked Marcus, he sent me the CAD drawing of this curve, uh, which was great. Uh, what I want is the landscape, this piece here. This will be the actual grass mat. The challenge I had is that this piece is 10 inches by 10 inches, and I have a standard inkjet printer that's just eight and a half by 11. So what I did is I took the CAD drawing, broke it into two pieces, uh, added some registration marks, and then after printing them to scale, taping them together, cutting them out, I was able to glue that onto the grass mat. And I will uh, make this, these two uh, PDF files available if you were interested in, in doing the same thing I did. So I just taped that onto the back of the, uh, the grass mat, cut it out, and then glued it on. And I used um, a hot glue gun. I uh, decided not to use the wood glue that I used for the model. I was a little worried that, that um, the glue would absorb into the uh, paper and stain the grass. So I used a hot glue gun for that. So now let's talk about the trees. Uh, the Jacobs model is one to 100 scale. So what that means is a three inch model tree represents a 25 foot tall real tree. Uh, I could not find any one to 100 scale trees. The closest thing I found was model railroad HO scale, which is one to one, uh, 87, which means those trees are a little bit too big. So I just bought HO scale tra trees and, and trimmed them down. So uh, to get them to the right size. If you're gonna do some hacking with Unity Temple, its scale is one to 250. Um, that's the closest thing is model railroad Z scale, which is one to 220. Um, a couple of other things I did. Um, the bottom of the, the model had this light color base, and you can also see the laser cut um, edge there. I found that distracting. So I painted this entire outline here with burnt umber acrylic paint. Also thought I did a really good job cutting out the grass mat, but you can see I was off by about a 16th or so here. Uh, I painted that with forest green acrylic paint to just touch that up a little bit. Ended up with this finished effect. I did find on Amazon, and I'll, this will be in the material list, a couple one to 100 scale benches. And then this is HO scale bushes that I've uh, trimmed, again, to get them to the right scale, and then just uh, hot glue gun them into place. I think I am going to, like quite a few people have done, is, is add some texture to the roof to make it look uh, more realistic. I'm also playing a little bit with lighting the interior of this model. I absolutely don't have anything I want to show you right now. But um, I have purchased some lights and trying to light the interior to make, again, look, look more realistic. So that's what I had to say about the, the Jacobs. Uh, now I want to move on and uh, do a Q&A session with Marcus Brick. He's the founder and creator of all these amazing little building co-models. After studying engineering and three-dimensional design at college, Marcus began his international career that would take him from Japan to Hong Kong to the USA uh, and finally uh, across Australia and then finally to Brisbane in Queensland where he now runs his own design company. So if we can get, there's Marcus. Um, so I'm gonna ask okay. you questions. And um, so it focused on hacking your model and in particular on, on finishing. So Marcus, in a, in a previous webinar, you talked about wax and got into pretty pretty good detail. So our audience, if they want to um, learn about waxing the model, they can watch that clip. 
But the question I have is, do you need to wax the model? Do you need to finish it? Or can you leave it nude as, as, as Paul would say? Well, what yeah, I, 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 I personally have never painted any of the models. Um, I prefer them nude. Um, that's just because, because I like the timber effect. Um, but again, if you are going to wax them, I'd recommend using paste wax. And again, like you said, we've previously um, discussed that, and that's typically applied. You can apply that before you've built your model, um, which is probably easier, or after the event. Once you have built it, you could use a cotton bud to apply the wax, um, and then use a hairdryer just to gently heat, heat the wax so it's absorbed by the timber, um, and then go back and apply a second coat, and again, just burnish it off with a, um, a paintbrush. Or a, or a soft cloth. Um, and yeah, that's, that's so how if I would. We're going to paint the model. Um, what would you recommend? Um, I think if you get if you're going to paint them, um, with with most painting, it's all in the preparation. So clean your model to start with and remove any um, of the. It's this when it, when they're laser cut, they end up with a little bit of smoke on the surface. So rather than aggravate the surface of the timber um, with sandpaper or something, just use a light blade, the size of a side of a blade, just to lightly scrape um, the dust off, because it is, it's just superficial dust. Um, and then seal your model. I'd seal the timber with a, a timber sealer, um, something that penetrates and doesn't form a skin. So typically an acrylic sealer would be, would be um, what I would recommend. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, I know we talked a little bit about staining the model. And um, yes, so I, you, you yeah, send me this picture. So what is this about? <laughs> that's, a, that's a box of um, drawings that I had at college. So that's about 30 years old. But any, any I've only ever used, if you flick to the next slide, um, I've only used inks, which um, are absorbed by the timber fairly quickly. Um, and I apply it or in this instance, just apply it with the grain of the timber. Um, and it, it's absorbed by the timber. So unlike paint, it doesn't fill in all the detail. Um, and I think I've lightly, yeah, and that one, I think I lightly sanded that one. Um, and it gives, I think it gives a more, obviously not in bright pink or green, but I think you could get a far subtler effect probably with that um, than painting. But if you were gonna paint them, I'd, I'd dry brush paint them as opposed to, um, Having having liquid paint, so so get your brush fairly dry, dip it in the paint, and dry, and then brush that onto your timber, because you don't want you don't want your timber to distort, which if you apply a lot of moisture to it, it'll absorb it, and it it'll um it'll go a bit bendy possibly. But again, just put it under a book or something and let it dry out, um, mm. and then go from there. And when I when I assemble the models, I typically I bandage I I call it bandage, bandaging them up. So I would use masking tape along all the joints that I glue. Um, and I, I, you know, I, I strap them pretty tightly. Um, that stops any kind of movement. Um, so, you know, we've talked a lot about the uh, This is a picture of the real thing. Yeah. So if somebody wanted to take the model, which looks like this, and yeah. do you think it's possible that, that if somebody wanted to make it look like the Unity Temple. Yeah. Is that even possible? I think so. I think if you um again, if you if you work methodically, so if your plan is to do that from the word go, I would um if you flick to the, the slide of the model, um it's the, the edges of the timber which are cut by the laser, which I think would cause you the most um grief's not the word, but it, you would need to um you would need to prime those, otherwise the moment you start painting, you're going to be two or three coats behind on the edges that, as opposed to painting the surface of the timber. So paint an undercoat, the edges first, and then, and then work your way around to the front. Um, and I think you'd get a far better finish if you did that, like I said, prior to assembling the model. Um, and again, seal the timber so that, because MDF axles pretty much like a sponge. So you want that to be a nice even surface to start with. And again, I would use acrylic paints, water-based paints are far easier to use. And again, with a sealer, I wouldn't use, I wouldn't use any oil-based 
uh, more spirit based. And um, would, the, would the pain and feeler interfere with the adhesive? You know, I think, it, yeah. With, this is a series of pieces assembled together. Yes, I, I would assemble. I would assemble all those little assemblies first, um, because if you paint or seal any of that, you might affect the adhesive's ability to actually bond to itself. Mm. Um, and uh, again, if, you, if you're going to do it seriously, maybe get yourself a big magnifying glass and do it through that. Because, um, mm. like Paul said, if you take a if you take a picture of something and then analyze that, um, it highlights all the imperfections. That you don't pick up with your eye. I mean, obviously that's that's no good when you're doing it, but um, it helps educate you. Uh, sorry, it helps educate you for your next model. Um, mm. Yeah. So um, there was one question that would probably be a correction. I, I said that this Unity Temple was one to two fifty scale. Is am, did I screw that up? Am I wrong? Uh, I don't have one to hand. Um, that sounds about right. Yeah, I thought I thought it. Yeah, yeah. the I know the, the, the Usonian the, house is a one to one hundred. Jacobs is one to one hundred. It's so the bigger models, um, like yeah. the, uh, the Tate is one to twelve hundred. It's it's that's a huge. Yeah. Well, um, it's it is on my website. It's in on the yeah. model yeah. website. We you know can find the scale. <laughs> Um, all right, so we're running a little over. Um, so thank you, Marcus. Thank uh, you, Greg. Thank you, and thank you for the other modelers too. Paul and yeah. um, so, like I said at the beginning, this uh, we've recorded this entire program. We'll take the recording and turn it into segments. You can go to our Model Landmarks YouTube channel probably by the end of next week. Uh, you'll be able to find if you wanted to refer back to any of these recordings. Um, also next week, we'll be posting a materials list. So if you want to do that light box, if you want to look for some shoe polish, um, we'll have that um, all up there uh, if you want uh, in the new section of our website. So to conclude, I want to thank again, Marcus, Stephen, and Paul for sharing their ideas. Uh, we definitely plan on doing more of these tips and tricks uh, sorts of webinars. I hope you find it useful. If you have something to share, if you're a modeler and you have something to share, we'd love to, to, to feature you and hear about what you're doing with your models. So please reach out to me. Same thing with photos. If you've got photos of your models, I'd love to see those again uh, as well. And we'll put those in the customer photo gallery on the website. So thank you for joining us and hope to see you next time. Thanks a lot.